American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about Ed Harris. Well, we're really talking about Jean Kranz, who was played by Ed Harris in the 1995 film Apollo 13. Harris was nominated for an Oscar for his portrayal of the no-nonsense, tough, and competent flight director who brought the Apollo 13 crew home safely. Now, who would play you in a film? I'm thinking Megan Fellows, who played Anne Shirley in the Anne of Green Gables movies back in the 80s. And I think it's pretty obvious who would play me. Barry Fitzgerald. I have no idea who that is. I was thinking Lionel Barrymore. Anyway, good guess, but no, it's obviously Russell Crowe. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, back to a man who didn't have time to play games on the job. Right, no, he didn't. And he actually was instrumental in making absolute professionalism and teamwork a way of life at NASA during his 34 years there. Yes, as mentioned before, he made the words tough and competent guiding principles for everyone he worked with and even had his team members write those words on the chalkboards in their offices, never to be erased. And considering the near-run thing that is manned spaceflight and how many things can go wrong resulting in catastrophe and death, Taking an absolutely uncompromising approach to doing the job the right way is kind of important. Yes, it is. So let's talk about Gene Kranz, starting with where he came from. Well, he was born in 1933 and grew up in the hometown of Danny Thomas and Corporal Klinger, Toledo, Ohio. He had two older sisters, and his father was a veteran of World War I. His father, however, died when he was just seven in 1940, leaving his mother to raise the three children on a farm outside of town. He was an altar boy at nearby St. Agnes Church, where he remembered serving many weddings for soldiers shipping off to World War II. He also recalled how the parish priest, Father John Jameson, became something of a father figure to so many of the boys whose fathers were overseas fighting. Right, and considering his father had died, that probably applied to him also. Uh, likely, yeah. Uh, he went to Toledo Catholic Central High School, and when he graduated in 1951, the nuns helped him put together his application to enter the U.S. Naval Academy, but he failed his physical and was rejected. So rather than the Navy, the sisters helped him instead to pursue his lifelong passion, flight. Right. As he said in his memoir later in life, he had always wanted to fly. Quote, I had my head in the clouds and my heart followed. So the sisters helped him get into St. Louis University's Parks College of Engineering, Aviation, and Technology, where he studied aeronautical engineering, and he graduated in 1954. He entered the U.S. Air Force Reserve, went through basic, and completed flight training at Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. He got married in 1955 to Marta Cardenia, whose parents had fled Mexico during that country's revolution, and he was sent to Korea, where he flew patrol missions. When his tour ended in 1956, he came home and resigned his active duty commission. He went to work for McDonnell Aircraft Corporation, and helped test and develop surface-to-air and air-to-surface missile technologies. Then, in 1960, came his big break. NASA came calling. Exactly. The space race was kicking off, and Kennedy was elected president and was about to promise to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. NASA needed good men. And not just good men but men who were absolutely excellent at their job, dedicated to success, and who were great teammates. Right, that's the thing about Gene Krantz. He was, and is, he's still alive, completely organized, mission-oriented, structured, and process-oriented, utterly dedicated to his team. He was a natural leader with a commanding voice and a gung-ho, no-nonsense attitude, and the perpetual high-and-tight haircut to go with it. So Kranz was recruited to work on the Mercury Space Program, and his boss and longtime collaborator, Chris Kraft, brought him into flight operations where he worked on Mercury, then Gemini, and eventually Apollo flights. Meanwhile, his family was growing as he and Marta had five daughters and a son through the late 50s and into the 60s. And once they moved to Texas for his job at Mission Control in Houston, 
they became active parishioners at the Shrine of the True Cross Parish in Dickinson. Home life was marked by the same organization and routine that made him so good at his job. Honeydews were kept on careful lists. His daily routine was clockwork. He would have his breakfast, wish all of his kids well as they went off to school, and as he was heading out the door, he would leave Marta with, Have I told you I love you today? before hopping into the station wagon and turning up John Philip Sousa marches way too loud for the drive to work. His daughter Jeannie, who would eventually follow him into NASA, said of her father, If the character role of Ward Cleaver was based on anyone real, it was likely my dad. And Marta seemed to have a bit of Donna Reed in her. She would always sew Jean a new vest for each spaceflight mission he was involved in. These vests became a hallmark for Jean, and the one he wore for the Apollo 13 mission is in the Smithsonian. Okay, so none of this really jumps out and screams, this is an extraordinary man. It's like his superpower was keeping things calm and organized and everyone on task. Well, that's not a bad superpower considering what he was doing. True. And his utter professionalism and other leadership qualities really came to the fore after tragedy struck. Right. It was January 1967, and the Apollo missions were about to begin. Apollo 1 was in the works, slated to launch in late February. The team was charging to launch, and there were lots of moving parts. On January 27, the three astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee, were in the cockpit of the rocket, and the whole team was going through a routine test launch. And then a spark of some sort ignited the oxygen-rich environment of the cockpit. A terrible fire broke out and all three astronauts died before the hatch could be opened. It was a horrible time for everyone in NASA, but especially for those directly involved in Apollo 1, including Gene Krantz. Krantz was flight director. He had worked closely with the astronauts for years, and he determined that this would never happen again. The Monday following the tragedy, he spoke to his team about the disaster. His short speech became known as the Krantz Dictum. He said, quote, Spaceflight will never tolerate carelessness, incapacity, and neglect. Somewhere, somehow, we screwed up. It could have been in design, build, or test. Whatever it was, we should have caught it. We were too gung-ho about the schedule, and we locked out all of the problems we saw each day in our work, unquote. He expanded on that, and then he said, quote, From this day forward, flight control will be known by two words, tough and competent. Tough means we are forever accountable for what we do or what we fail to do. We will never again compromise our responsibilities. Every time we walk into mission control, we will know what we stand for. Competent means we will never take anything for granted. We will never be found short in our knowledge and in our skills. Mission control will be perfect. When you leave this meeting today, you will go to your office, and the first thing you will do there is to write tough and competent on your blackboard. It will never be erased. Each day when you enter the room, these words will remind you of the price paid by Grissom, White, and Chafee. These words are the price of admission to the ranks of mission control, unquote. And it stuck. Those words, tough and competent, have become the mantra of mission control. Mission control went back, they reviewed everything, they reformulated procedures, redesigned the spacecraft to make it more safe, and rededicated themselves to perfection in their duties. Krantz instituted a go, no go check down, giving every part of the team the ability to stop the whole process if their part of the process wasn't ready. Along with tough and competent becoming the mantra for mission control, Kranz also took the lead in developing what is known as the foundations of mission control, which commits everyone in mission control to the following. One, to instill within ourselves these qualities essential to professional excellence, discipline, competence, Confidence, responsibility, toughness, teamwork, and vigilance. And each of those is explained, but we'll skip the explanations. Two, to always be aware that suddenly and unexpectedly we may find ourselves in a role where our performance has ultimate consequences. And three, to recognize that the greatest error is not to have tried and failed, but that in the trying we do not give it our best effort. Kranz credited his Catholic faith with providing the underpinnings of these tenets. To this day, this code of conduct sets the standard at mission control. Kranz was flight director for Apollo 11 in 1969 when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon, 
and all went well on that mission. But the very next year, another mission to the moon did not go so well. Right, the one for which he is so well known, Apollo 13, which launched on April 11th, 1970. It met disaster on April 13th and only barely made it back to Earth on April 17th. If you haven't seen the movie Apollo 13, do yourself the favor and watch it. We're not getting into the details of what happened on Apollo 13, but the astronauts only came home because of the can-do, work-together, failure-is-not-an-option culture that Kranz had developed in mission control. Now, that line, failure is not an option, became a catchphrase for the movie, and Ed Harris says it as Gene Kranz a number of times. But the thing is, Kranz never actually said that. No, he didn't. I mean, for one, he didn't have to. That was a known thing, and it didn't have to be said. And that's actually kind of how it became the catchphrase. Right. The screenwriters working on the movie script, Al Reinhardt and Bill Broyles, interviewed Jerry Bostick, who was Flight Dynamics officer on Apollo 13, to get his take on how it all went down. They asked him if there was ever a time when everyone just panicked. He said, quote, No, when bad things happened, we just calmly laid out all the options, and failure was not one of them, unquote. Broyles took that thought and just went with it. So, failure is not an option became the way to verbalize in a two-hour film what Krantz spent years cultivating as a culture. Teamwork, professionalism, and being excellent at your job is the only way to be. And it saved the day. It's the Krantz way. Yeah, and what's also the Krantz way is accomplishing all of this without really getting the public recognition of others like the astronauts themselves do. Right. Kranz is fairly well-known now because of the movie, but he never has been and never will be as well-known as the astronauts involved. They got parades and all the public appearances. Actually, that brings up another tidbit about Kranz. He was asked if he ever wished he'd become an astronaut rather than being in mission control. And he said that while astronauts only get to go on a few missions, he'd been able to be involved in dozens of them. Right. This podcast episode is about Kranz, and Kranz was played by someone the stature of Ed Harris, but Kranz himself would be the first to tell you that it was a whole team effort. Yeah, he really embodies the old adage, you never know what you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. But he did get some of the credit with the astronauts of the Apollo 13 mission. Right, his team and the astronauts all were awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So in this case, the support team did get the recognition that they deserved. And Kranz himself had something of a following within NASA and the space flight community. It was in part for his idiosyncrasies and in part just because of how good of a leader, mentor, and advocate he was, particularly with younger NASA staffers. He recognized that they were the future of NASA and wanted to make sure that they were well prepared. But his kids would on occasion get questions about, is it true that your dad does X? Kranz continued working in mission control and then was promoted to higher positions in NASA finally retiring in 1994. He published his memoirs in 2000 and titled it, Failure is Not an Option, finally taking as his own the phrase Bill Broyles put in his mouth. In 2007, NASA awarded Kranz the Ambassador of Exploration Award, an award meant to recognize the sacrifices and dedication of the Apollo, Gemini, and Mercury astronauts. Kranz asked that the ceremony be held back home at Toledo's Catholic Central High School, And upon accepting the award, which is a rock brought back from the moon, Kranz gave the moon rock to the high school, making Toledo Catholic Central the only high school in the world that has a moon rock on permanent display. In 2016, he began an effort to restore the abandoned mission control room where he had led so many missions, leading, once again leading, a mission which saw people scouring eBay for authentic period ashtrays, matching old scraps of paint and carpet, and finding chairs and other furniture to make that room where so much history had happened look just as it did when he was leading missions. To his mind, that room was every bit as important as the spacecraft that had actually taken the astronauts into space, so it deserved to be preserved for future generations as well. The restoration was completed in 2019, in time for the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Gene Kranz will be 87 in August of 2020 and he and his wife Marta still live down in Dickinson, Texas. He remains active in the Catholic community. He's a Knights of Columbus, and in July of 2019, he was the honored speaker at the Archdiocese Galveston-Houston Prayer Breakfast. At that prayer breakfast, he showed the audience his tattered and worn copy of Fulton Sheen's 
the shield of faith, reflections, and prayers for wartime, which he said he had pulled out many times. He also said, I've been asked if I ever felt stress. No matter, I always felt the presence of God in my work and my life. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please be sure to give us a rating and a review. To learn more about today's topic, to find previous episodes, and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com slash history. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on social media at facebook.com slash American Catholic History or follow StarQuest on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest. Be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Five stars.